Luke chapter 6, verse number 6. The Bible says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was with him a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. Now watch this. But he knew their thoughts. How many of you know he knows what we're thinking? It does not have to leave our mouth for him to be aware. Now the devil doesn't have that power. But God is always aware. Look at verse 8. He knew their thoughts. And said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Then Jesus said unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man. This is what I want you to notice. He said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand, singular. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Father, open up our eyes today. May we receive help. May we receive hope from your word. Give us courage to confront truth. God, give us obedience to pursue you afterwards. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus comes to the synagogue, to church. and There is a man laying there, as many people did, who were infirmed or ill or handicapped in some way, and they would basically receive alms or they would beg for money outside the gates or the doors of the synagogue. They knew that all them self-righteous righteous Baptists wanted to look good on their way into the house of God. What better place to ask for money than somewhere folks are trying to look like they're good people. It's a pretty good business strategy, amen. So they would set up outside the doors of the synagogue and they would receive pity and often money from parishioners. So this man, his issue is his right hand. The Bible tells us that very plainly in verse 6. His right hand is withered. Now Jesus sees this and the Lord is going to heal this man and he says to him, stretch forth thy hand. Now I'm going to need an amen. This is complicated. This man has two hands. I'm going to say it again. I'll let y'all process that, okay? This man has two hands. He's got a left hand and he's got a right hand. His left hand is whole. It is complete. It has no issues whatsoever. His right hand has received some condition where it is now crippled. It is now lame. It does not function. It is drawn in and it has no strength. He has two hands, a good left hand and a wrong right hand. His right's done gone wrong. Can I get an amen? And Jesus says, show me your hand. And this man does not show his good hand, but rather he stretches forth his wrong hand. Now here's what I want to say today. It is human nature. And it is built into me and it is built into you. And if y'all don't help me and testify, I'm going to let your family stand up and tell all the truth in the house of God. So you just... Confess your own sin before they do it for you, all right? It is human nature in me and in you to first show what is right about us and to hesitantly, once we are forced, to admit there's something wrong with us. Jesus said, show me your hand. He did not say which one. And he's got two. He's got a good one and a bad one. But this man 
showed forth not what was so good about him, but he showed Jesus what was wrong with him. It's built in every last one of us to want to display what we do well and hide that which is not whole. You know, you can, <laughs> you can see this in, in, our, in our lives from our earliest memories. As a little child, isn't it amazing you do not have to teach kids to lie? Isn't that amazing? They are, that's built in. They're born little liars. I need y'all to help me preach in it. They're born liars. <laughs> Walk in the living room with Oreos running down on their shirt. What's in your mouth? Nothing. <laughs> we don't like to admit when we're wrong or when something's not right. There is a basic cover-up instinct in us that I believe we got from Adam and Eve and it has transcended generations and it's present today. We are quick to point out our strengths and we are quick to hide our weaknesses. We are quick to show the areas where we are strong and we are quick to veil the areas where we're not doing as good as we ought to. I was about 12 years old and I've got three brothers. My brother Chad's the next one up. The other, they're all older than me, but Chad's just about two years older than me. And I guess this little illustration ought to come with a disclaimer that this is not wise behavior. But I do want to say something to moms and dads. If you have a a boy, and I can't speak on behalf of girls, but if you have a boy, and by that I mean a male up to 40 years of age. I'm looking out for us, fellas. And he does something extremely stupid. And you look at him and say, why did you do that? And he says, I don't know. That's the truth. (laughs) If you say, what were you thinking? And he says, I wasn't. He's being honest with you. Amen. Was 40 a little low? Did I shoot low on that? (laughs) I had one of those 10 pump Daisy BB guns. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about one of them that on that 10th pump you had to stand on it because pressure was building. Now now we was poor. I, I, I grew up pretty poor. We had a BB gun, but we ain't seen no BBs in about six weeks. We were sitting on the back porch of our little house <laughs> and I was pumping up that gun and my brother was doing something over here and I would point that gun at his head and pull the trigger and watch the air puff his hair out. Just so there's several things here. I don't know why I was doing that and I don't know why he was letting me do that but that's what was happening. True story. Well, I I had been doing that for several minutes. <coughs> and I pumped it up again and I put it up there by his head and pulled that trigger to watch the hair just and this time. <laughs> friend, if he can turn water into wine, he can turn air into BBs. <laughs> it wasn't the first, it's not the first shot. I've been doing this for minutes. I don't know where that BB came from. (laughs) Wham! And I heard a blood-curdling scream. Wah! I thought he was playing until I seen the blood running between his fingers and down his arm. I have shot him literally right there. Right, I don't know what your temple is, but it was right there, right above his ear, right in his hairline. Wham, 10 pumps with the daisy. Blood running down his arm. And can anybody guess what came out of my mouth? Don't tell dad. (laughs) 
Just die. <laughs> Ain't no need in both of us dying. You're already halfway there. Just... <laughs> I'll bury you. It'll be nice. Just don't tell Dad. Now, isn't that amazing? That I'm talking about I did not have to think about. That was my first words. Don't tell Dad. And I wonder how many of us in life live with that mentality. Don't tell Dad. Don't tell nobody that I messed up. Don't tell nobody that I did it wrong. Don't tell anybody that I have failed or that I'm having trouble or that I'm having difficulty and we take our withered hand and we shove it in our pocket and we walk around flexing with our good arm. And we want to make sure that people see our good hand. But we don't want nobody to know that there is weakness and disability in our life. It is a natural instinct for us to veil our struggle and to display our strength. And that's okay unless you want wrong things to be made right again. See, Adam and Eve had that don't tell dad mentality. Because they sinned in the garden and when they realized that they had sinned and they had fell from the glory of God, they immediately ran and they hid and they sewed together fig leaves so that they could hide what was wrong. Does anybody remember Achan in your Old Testament that went and stole from the enemy? God said don't take anything but yet he did and he took it back and he didn't wear those Babylonian garments. He did not go to market and spend that currency, that silver and that gold but rather he hid it in his tent and he dug a hole and he buried it. It is human nature. It is our sinful nature to conceal what's wrong with us because we want everybody to think that we are as strong as our left hand indicates we are. And I'm going to need an amen. I can still call on your people to testify. Don't y'all die on me. We need, we need some help right here. We want people to see our strength. But all of us have got a withered hand hidden from view. Something that is not right. Something that needs to be better. You know, one thing that's so interesting about this is the Bible says it is a withered hand. That indicates that it happened to that hand. He was not born with a defect. He was not born lame on this hand. But it indicates that it has withered, that something, paralysis, some disease has, listen to me, has caused what was okay to become not okay. And it's one thing if you've been dealing with it all of your life. But it's another thing if stuff was good and then it's not. If things were right and then they're wrong. This man is presented with a choice. Am I going to be honest before Jesus? And and Jesus is making a show out of him, by the way. This was not an every head bowed, every eye closed kind of moment. Jesus looked around told that man, get up, come here and stand in the middle. Come here, stand up and come here. Boy, Jesus wouldn't have made it very long as a pastor, would he? I mean, they'd have voted him out about the second invitation. He said, stand up and come here right in the middle. And everybody's looking. And Jesus says, show me your hand. And this man in that instantaneous reaction, he takes that which is broken And he stretches it out toward the Lord. I wrote down a couple of things and I want to say it right. I want to say it the way I wrote it down. Here it is. We often conceal what we need to heal. But God has a tendency to heal what we reveal. Can I say that again? Now you'll know why I wrote it down. 
We often conceal the area that we need to heal. We like to hide it, conceal it. But God has a tendency to only heal what we are willing to reveal. You read in your Old Testament, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins is going to have great difficulty. But he that comes before God openly is going to find healing and forgiveness. It's so funny that we, you know, like my brother with a, with a bleeding head, that we think somehow this is going to go undetected. You know? But God knows. Matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 4, He said there is neither any creature that is not manifest in His sight. And here is some real plain language. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. God sees it all. If you believe that, say amen. amen. God sees it all. Now the Bible talks about men love darkness rather than light because we think we can veil our acts in the dark. But God sees through the dark. And we believe that. I believe you believe that. It's common sense. That if He is supreme, omnipotent, almighty God, that He is all-seeing, He is all-knowing, and He is aware of everything about us, good and bad. We believe that. I believe you believe that. Here's a question. If we believe that, why is it so hard to verbalize that? Because it's an issue of pride. It's an issue of holding up a facade. And here's the thing. We're afraid if we get honest with God, we're going to end up having to get honest with other people. And so we just choose not to be honest at all. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll lie to God because that's good practice for me to lie to y'all. If I can lie to God, I can lie to you. And so we conceal Things that we need to heal. And, and, and we put our withered hand in our pocket and we walk around with a strong left hand and we want the world to think that we've got it together. And it is a dangerous thing to be more concerned about your image than it is your healing. It's a dangerous thing to be more concerned about what people think about you than you are what God knows about you. I'm going to preach now. You're obsessed with what people think about you and we ought to be concerned about what God knows about us. He knows you better than your Instagram profile. He knows you better than your Facebook post. He knows you better than the you that shows up in public. He sees the moments of our lives we wish we could erase from our history. He sees the lowest places that it's hard to believe we were ever even there. He sees it all. But we have real trouble verbalizing to Him that we know that He knows. Because lying becomes a way of life. And you're lying to God, and you're lying to others, and ultimately you're lying to yourself. And all the while you're lying, you've got a withered hand that He can heal if you just get it out of your pocket and say, this is what's wrong. Is this helping anybody this morning? Is this hurting anybody this morning? Me too. Good. We want people to see our best. You know... I feel for a generation that is raised with their lives being so public. And, and I, I'm not against social media. I think there's a lot right about it. And I don't think you ought to air all of your difficulties in your dirty laundry. And I don't think you ought to air everybody else's difficulties in their dirty laundry. Especially that one. So I'm not telling you know, that you're, you're supposed to be transparent about all everybody has problems difficulties and struggles but here's what I'm telling you is in that image building make sure that you keep in real good touch with who you are make sure that you don't forget who you are that's why 
Confessing our sin to God is such an important part of our relationship. Because confess, you know, we have this idea that we're supposed to come to God and beg Him for forgiveness when we sin as believers. And there should be repentance in our heart. There should be remorse in our heart when we sin. Somebody say amen. But, but to have my relationship restored with God, I do not come and beg Him to forgive me. He forgave me on the cross when He shed His blood and died for my sin. I'm not begging God to forgive me as a believer. He's already forgiven me. He said if things are not right, confess that sin. Now what does confess mean? It means to say what God said. To admit that it's true. You don't have to come and beat your chest. You know they have ceremonies down in South America around the week of Easter and Passover and supposedly Christians. I would say they're not Christians, but under the name of Christianity. They'll spread broken glass all over stairwells and paths and people will crawl on their hands and knees through that broken glass bleeding and they're showing their penance for their sin. Let me tell you something. The path to forgiveness with God is not a path of crawling through broken glass. It is a path that crucifies pride and says, Lord, you're right. I was wrong. I did it. I'm preaching. And there's a whole lot of us, and I'll put me in this little boat, there's a whole lot of us, we'd rather crawl through broken glass than have to own the reality about our withered hand. Restitution with God and restoration with God, it is not made when you prove yourself sorry. It is made when you put yourself before Him and you become honest. And you say, Lord, you said this is sin. You said this is wrong. And I have gone against your word. I did it. It's true. And the moment that with a repentant heart, you line up with the scripture, and you audibly, and you in your spirit come before God, and you see your sin is sin, and you, just, you, you justly come to Him admitting you're wrong. It is then that that fellowship is restored in the presence of God. Did you know God doesn't put Christians on probation? You don't, you don't come to Him and confess your sin. He said, all right, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you nine months. And then check back in with me and we'll see if we can't make this right. No. Forgiveness and restoration is instantaneous with God. Because we are not forgiven off of our merit. We are forgiven by His grace. The only thing this man had to do was be willing to embrace his weakness, expose his weakness, and humbly bring it to Jesus. And when he did that, when he was willing to reveal, it was then that Christ was willing to heal. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And then He went on in another place and said that we are to confess our faults, not our sins. We are to confess our faults one to another. And we don't confess our sin to one another. I'd be very careful about that because you may confess your sin and their sin may be gossip. And boy, that's just a rough circle to get caught up in right there. <laughs> But confessing your faults becomes easier once you've humbled yourself and come into touch with the reality that you have faults. And there is healing and power when we stop concealing and we start revealing.